10 gigabit networking is for the most part not only quite expensive, but it's also much more complex compared to the regular gigabit networking that's been around for more than 25 years now. In this video, I'll use our prototype router board to show you why that's the case and we will go as low as possible all the way to the traces on the PCB. Today's video will be a little bit different than normal because I want to show you the results of one of the final tests we have yet to run before we order the second revision of our prototypes and that test is the actual throughput of the theoretical max 10 gigabits per second on our two SFP plus ports. Now those of you who have been following my channel for a while now might say wait didn't you already test that to which I'll reply by saying yes and no. On the yes side, we did indeed test the CPU's ability to forward 10 gigabits of data per second, but that test was done on the reference design board and the primary purpose of that test was to verify the manufacturer's claim that the CPU can indeed do what it says on the label. But that is not what today's test is about. You see, apart from the CPU, there's also a couple of other components in the, let's call it the physical chain that the electrical signals go through in order to reach the actual, in our case, either optical or copper cable. And those components are the retimer, which we'll talk about more shortly, the SFP connector that's inside this cage here, and finally, the PCB traces themselves. And if you're wondering, wait, traces? Then my answer is yes, <laughs> traces. Actually, before I explain, let me show you how the 10 gigabit traces look on our PCB. Unlike literally all the other traces that you can find on it, these ones are curved and there's a very good reason for that. With high speeds, and 10 gigabits per second definitely count as a high speed signal, we want to minimize what are called parasitic effects of the glass fibers that are between the copper layers on said copper layers. If you've never seen how a PCB substrate is manufactured, I don't blame you, it's not exactly common knowledge, but I bet most of you have seen how a carbon fiber sheet looks like. You have a layer of fibers going in one direction and then either on top or more often even interleaved, you have another layer that goes in a direction that's per -per 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 <laughs> perpendicular to the layer below, right? This approach gives it that signature carbon fiber look, but what's more important, it makes the whole structure tougher and more resistant to mechanical stress. Well, the same applies to glass fibers in the PCB, but unlike the carbon fiber, we have high speed signals next to those fibers. And what we want to avoid as much as possible is the signals going either parallel or, or perpendicular to those fibers, because in either of the two cases, glass fibers introduce parasitic effects, which manifest themselves in changed inductance or capacitance, in the traces that is, both resulting in worse signal integrity. Another solution to this problem would also be controlled fiber orientation, meaning we could potentially order PCBs that would be cut from the panels at a set angle to ensure they avoid any 45 degree angle that our traces are routed at. But that would bring the cost up, well, quite substantially, so curved traces are a much cheaper alternative that solves exactly the same problem. I'll leave it at this because this topic is a quite complex one, but if you want to do more research on your own, start by googling PCB fiber weave effect and see how deep the rabbit hole goes for yourself. But the bottom line is this, at high speeds, trace shape, its length, its thickness and the distance within a differential pair matters and designers need to pay special attention to make sure that those traces can indeed achieve 10 gigabit throughput. Okay, the next component we need to talk about is this very expensive chip right here called the retimer. As the name suggests, its primary purpose is, well, retiming signals, but I know that doesn't tell you much, so think of it like this. A signal, a digital signal, is comprised of zeros and ones to transport information between devices. And when I say devices here, I mean both a device such as your phone or a laptop, as well as an individual chip that talks to another using, say, an interface such as an I2C, SPI, UART, or any number of other protocols that exist out there, right? 
From an electrical standpoint, these signals often get shown as a square wave between 0 volts and whatever the max voltage the chips that talk to one another operate at, uh, most common 1.8 volts, 3.3 volts or 5 volts. Now, for theoretical examples, this is usually good enough, but in practice, they, these signals don't really look like this. They look like this. When the transmitting device generates a logical 1, it needs to switch its output from 0 volts to, let's say, 5 volts. And in practice, it's virtually impossible to do it in an instant. Instead, it ramps the voltage up over a very short period of time. And if the clock is fast enough, it might even never get to 5 volts in our example, which is why the actual threshold for a logical 1 is set at 70% meaning that the receiver will register this logical 1 once the signal on its input reaches 3.5 volts. And inversely, on a falling edge, which is the transition from a logical 1 to a logical 0, it'll register the change once the voltage drops below 1.5 volts. With all these measurements combined, we can then layer several streams of data on top of one another and we get an image that you've probably seen before, the eye diagram. We won't go much more in depth here because we've already strayed from the main topic somewhat, but what you need to know in the context of retimers is that their main purpose is to take this somewhat imperfect signal and make it, well, as close to perfect as possible. But, and here's the kicker, that's not what we use it for. <laughs> we use it for its secondary feature, translation. You see, the electrical interface that SFP modules use to communicate with the CPU in our case is called an SFI. Our CPU, on the other hand, so the Mac side of this pair, comes with an interface called XFI. Now, hopefully you already see where this is going. SFI on the SFP module and XFI on the CPU are unfortunately not electrically compatible, so you need a translator in the middle, and this translator is the read timer chip. And a not so fun fact, it's the second most expensive chip on the board, right after the CPU, coming in at a whopping $15. And yes, if we could omit it from our design, we definitely would, given our traces between the CPU and the SFP connectors are only around 70 millimeters, so they don't really need any kind of signal conditioning. Anyway, there's much more we could talk about this, but I'll just say one more thing on the matter. And that's the fact that the retimer chip on our boards come with an I squared C bus. So those of you who will pre-order the development kit will have complete and completely unrestricted access to the chip, which gives all sorts of information regarding the signal integrity. You just have to know where to look and we'll make sure you know where to look. This episode is brought to you by PCBWay. I've been working with them on my custom keyboard project and I was super impressed with their speed, quality and price, so I'm more than happy to recommend them to anyone who needs any kind of PCB manufacturing done, whether it's just for a couple of prototypes or if you need a larger production run. Link to their website, of course, down in the description. Back to the video. Okay, let's look at the setup now. Here in front of me, I have one of the first six prototypes, which we manufactured back in February and is running an SDK version of the Linux that we're working on. The purpose of this SDK image is to have some kind of a common baseline that will allow us to build our dream routing solution on top of. But what's even more important, I'd argue, it will help all of you to test it out and help us improve it by either providing code, documentation, or simply just feedback. We're using Yocto as the build system of choice simply because of its limitless versatility. I do realize it does come with a relatively steep learning curve and I'm thinking of making a couple of introduction to Yocto videos in which we'd basically start with a blank slate and build towards where our Yocto repository is right now. A configuration that builds two separate images, one builds a 32 megabyte NorFlash firmware with U-boot and a recovery kernel and one which is our normal Linux that runs on an EMMC drive. If you'd like that, let me know in the comments below and I'll prepare something that will hopefully help you dive into the Yocto ecosystem a bit more smoothly. Anyway, here's how the results of this Yocto build process look like. I already flashed both images to our board, so one on the NOR flash and the other on the EMMC drive, and once we turn the board on, we get into U-boot that's being copied into memory by ATF or ARM trusted firmware. 
Here, we can boot into what we call a recovery system by executing run recovery. This gets us into BusyBox-based initRAMFS and everything you've seen here so far is part of the 32 megabyte firmware image, including the kernel itself and the bundled root file system. The main purpose of this image is to be able to recover a bricked system so it comes with everything one might need for that. So full networking support, file system and partitioning programs, compression utilities, as well as some basic device management tools. So you'll be able to access and perform maintenance on most of the devices on this board, right? But we won't be performing our test here. So let's reboot the board into the SDK Linux that we flash the EMMC drive with. To do so, we can either interrupt uBoot and execute the boot command, or we can simply let it count down to zero, which is when it'll do exactly the same thing automatically. In either case, we end up with, you know, a proper Linux distribution that comes with most of what you'd expect from a single board computer, which is what our boards are at this moment. I expect we'll have plenty more videos on this topic around the launch of the development kits, pre-orders for which have been extended for a couple of months simply because it took us a bit longer to bring up the boards than we initially expected. So if you like what you see here, I encourage you to visit the link in the description and join almost 900 others that have already done so. And while you do that, I'll finally run the test. As you can see, we don't quite get full 10 gigabits due to the fact that I don't have a dedicated test rig yet, so I'm using my home network and my Mac Studio as the iPerf server, so some losses are to be expected. Once the test rig arrives, and subscribe for that, because I think it'll be a pretty cool video, <laughs> we're of course going to develop a much more, let's say, scientifically correct, isolated and data-driven tests, and on top of that, we're also speaking with a third party that is interested in hosting us in their test facilities in which they have what is called a Spirant test center. Now, if we go back to our test, I know what you might be thinking right now. How's that a proof of anything? You're just running some basic iPerf tests. Anyone can do that at home, right? And you're absolutely right. This is just a basic iPerf test. But if you've been paying attention throughout this video, this test answers one for this stage very important question. And that question is, are we good to order our second round of prototypes? With quantities of 20 to 30 boards that we're about to order, each board costs us around $800, which means we'd be throwing away almost 20 grand if we overlooked, uh, overlooked this seemingly trivial yet very important aspect of our 10 gigabit traces and components. And yes, I am exaggerating a little bit because there's plenty of other issues we identified on the first revision of the prototypes and their fixes all have to be applied and tested on the second revision. And depending on how thorough we were, and we believe we were very thorough, there might not even be a third revision, we'll go straight to production. So, can we order the second revision? Yes, we can. Tomasz from Slovenia, signing out.